Hey folks, it's Tom Oprah here, uh, the Shepherds of Wildlife Society, and you know we're working on a new film called The Last Keeper. I've spent, I don't know, probably too much time in Scotland. No, you can never spend too much time in Scotland, uh, but about 140 days over about a year and a half, starting in May of 22, and uh, today we're kind of coming to the end, full circle. And uh, we've been doing lots of video editing since the summer, uh, final video shoots in November in Scotland, stand-ups and all that. And then part of this big process is music. You know, without uh, every great film is only as good as, uh, well, half of it's visual and half of it's audio. And so it's really important that people understand that without great music, uh, you really don't have a great film. It pulls everything together and even adds more to it. And so today uh, we have Paul Mounsey here from the Isle of Sky. Paul is, uh, you know, uh, extraordinaire music composer. And we met Paul, uh, geez, it was what, last year? We were uh, in Sky and we had a chance to meet with Paul, who was referred to us from a friend, and uh, sat around, had a couple pints and talked about this film and, uh, and ended up, it became obvious that he was the right guy to work on the project. So, Paul, tell us just a little bit about yourself. And I know you don't like to talk about yourself, but tell these people, this guy living in Sky, who you are. Uh, who I, well, I'm, I'm um, uh, born and raised in Scotland, uh, but I've spent most of my adult life uh, in other countries. Uh, mostly in Brazil, and also in um, spent most of the last 12, 13 years in um, Los Angeles working in uh, writing music for uh, movies. Uh, in in um, a lot of kind of big blockbuster movies. Um, well, hey, um, just give us a half dozen titles of music that you've written music, you know, oh, that you've written music uh, for. Well, I've contributed music to some of the big sort of Marvel movies, uh, a lot of animations, because uh, animations generally need a lot of orchestral music, and so they need a lot of people on them. So I've, I've written for um, How to Train Your Dragon franchise, the Ice Age franchise, um and uh, a few others um and i usually forget the, m the movie i've worked on about 48 hours after i've finished working on it but well but you know you did work you did work speaking of animations you did work on a film in, that came out in 2020 a short animation that oh indeed yeah, yes yeah and that, and that particular film won an academy award for best it won short an film. academy award it did yeah so how, yeah. how did that all work out for you that um well uh the, well the, that academy award was for the the film that wasn't for the music but i mean i'm very proud to have uh provided the music for that little uh film that was from uh, Sony Pictures Animation, um, and uh, how it got to me, I, I honestly, I, I, I don't know. These things are sometimes a complete mystery, but, um, but I ended up uh, writing the music for that little animation, and 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 it it was done for not very much money, and in the end, it um, it won an Oscar. So that was that was very nice. Yeah, well, it's like I said earlier, you know, every film only half of it's the picture, the other half is the audio component. So yeah, well, you know. very few people recognize that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's for sure. So you're working on the last keeper. Obviously, you're yeah. from Scotland. Uh, you read the headlines. You know people around yeah. around the countryside and in the cities and stuff. So you're pretty well versed in some of the the land use conflicts that are going on in your country. You know, when when you well, first started, I have to say, yeah. I have to say that I I learned a lot from watching the film because it's a topic that very few people in Scotland are, are actually consciously engaged. In because as you say in the film, you know, eighty percent of Scottish people live in the central belt, that little, that narrow central belt between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Yeah, ur urban areas. The urban area, 
and their lives uh, frequently do not connect in any way with the highlands of Scotland. And the whole issue of land use, land management, land reform, um, it does not affect them in any way. And they will, they might read something in passing in the newspaper, but it's not a subject that many Scottish people really engage with in any realistic way. And uh, and I think this this film is um, it's very important. I think it's um, I I think it's going to be eye opening for a lot of people and for a lot of Scottish people too. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's a uh... the very fact that you've given uh, so many um, uh, voices. You we hear so many different voices. It's not just a sort of two way argument it's uh, we're hearing lots of factions with different points of view with slightly different points of view um and they're all they're all slightly incompatible with one another <laughs> and yeah. that's what makes it fascinating yeah no definitely and and obviously for you writing the music to this that that poses lots of challenges also not only because there are so many points of view that have to be out there but you know obviously you know myself as a director my goal is to put blinders on our viewers and force them to go down this path that i want them to go down uh and and in your job as a music composer it, it's 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 basically helping put the that uh that yellow brick road underneath that path that path so that people feel like they're on this this incredible journey. What what are some of the most difficult things for you as the composer on this project, as far as you know, trying to achieve the things that you know, kind of the direction I've given you on a on really a segment by segment basis? Yeah, yeah. the The biggest challenge for me, I I have found, uh, has been to to underscore, to punctuate, and to link the various um, dramatic threads within the narrative um, without drawing too much attention to the music because it's a complicated topic and there is a, a lot to be said in the movie and, and we can't have the music sort of popping its head out saying, hello, listen to me. We have to keep focused on what is being discussed. And so it's it's kind of, uh, it, it's been a bit of a task for me to, to, to sort of lower the, let's say lower the filter so that the, the intensity of whatever drama is happening on screen is, is not, you know, it's we're not Hollywood here. We're, we're <laughs> it's, yeah, and, that, it's, and that's one of the things. You know, this is a this is a is a documentary film. Yeah. So you know, the difference between a narrative and a documentary, obviously, you you have a lot more opportunity in a narrative film to build in you know fairly emotional scenes with little or no dialogue. Yeah. Um, a little bit harder with docs, though, uh, as I've told a lot of people, this is only my second feature film I've ever directed. You know, I've obviously done tons of short form stuff. And yeah. so it's been great working with you to get that input on kind of even looking at my next project, uh, the real Yellowstone here. I mean, I'm already decided there's some things I want to do, you know, with the music long before we get to this point to help build some of those stories up about to, to get that affinity towards your characters, which I think you can do in documentary films just as equally as you can in narrative. And, uh, but for me, it was a little bit of a learning experience, but I hope this film comes across to folks as a, as a really uh, eye opener, as you said, and an educational stuff. Do, do you have any music you could share with us a little bit about what you've created? Maybe hit the play, the space button or whatever, and, uh, and play a little bit of music for people to hear. I, I could, um, I can hit the space bar, but I'm not sure what's going to come out. But I, uh, let me let me see. And what uh, what scene are you in right now? That uh, on your timeline? A rather uh, controversial moment in the film where uh, they're talking about uh, how best.
to manage the numbers of red deer um, on on the on the hills and the estates in in relation to the land and uh, and how best to control the numbers. Um, so it is kind of uh, dramatic um, because no one agrees with anyone <laughs> here. Uh, and, and I'm trying to play this uh, sort of, but I don't, let, let's see what happens. If deer stalking is part of your income for the estate, I'm mm -hmm. so a big income and you can support many jobs, then you, you want to lessen the, the uh, winter mortality. So those estates are feeding sites, are feeding sites, to help them see through the winter. It could be argued that we should just leave them and what happens is what happens, but it, it's a business like any other. We're now in a phase where we're seeing how we manage their deer, not just as a not just as a So, hey, folks, Tom Oper here with the Shepherds Wildlife Society. You know, we're working on this new film, The Last Keeper. And today we're talking with Paul Munsey, our uh, music composer in Scotland in the Isle of Skye. And uh, we've already had uh, a preview earlier uh, uh, about what he's doing on the music and shared some stuff with us. And, and you know, and Paul, you've talked about the complexities of this film and, and how difficult does the storyline is and the issues. Kind of really, what do you see is a potential outcome? What would you want to see with the, the amount of, you know, the music that you're putting into it in order to try to help tell that story for me? Kind of what do you hope that we can accomplish with this film? Well, at... Uh... At minimum, I I would hope that um, at least on this side of the pond, uh, I would hope that more people would become um, conscious, knowledgeable, and uh, capable of engaging more actively in the whole question of uh, land use land management in in scotland especially the highlands of scotland uh, because it makes up the greater land mass of our country uh and yet it's it's still um almost totally unknown to the vast majority of scots yeah, you know, we uh, in this particular film, I had the opportunity to meet with obviously all the different opposing sides. And, and since the film is about ready to be wrapped up, I've reached out to, you know, the John Muir Trust, Scotland, the big picture, Trees for Life, uh, which are some of the biggest uh, groups that are pushing the rewilding side, which where the the uh, sporting estate size, the keepers, the gillies, the stalkers kind of feel like they're under the gun here. Like their lives, their lifestyle, their culture, their communities might be, uh, well, they're, they're being moved off the land and uh, because of, yeah. of policies and, and legislation that is being spurred by these groups that I mentioned. But my goal in making the film was to make it as, as neutral and as balanced as possible. But also it's a story about, it's called The Last Keeper. So obviously it's about keepers. But at the end of the day, I want to make sure as a species, we leave Scotland and the Highlands better than we found it. I want to make sure that, that my grandkids or your great grandkids, great grandkids can see that 
that, you know, see those deer on the, on the hill and, and see the grouse and see all, all these other species of animals live there and have healthy ecosystems with, you know, vibrant forest and, and, uh, yeah. and, and great, you know, opportunities for, you know, just for these ecosystems to be a, a positive thing, you know, which we, we have to have, right. We're part of this. This is, this is our world yeah. and, and yeah. we have a huge impact on it. And, um, and so I have reached out to all those groups and said, Hey, we're going to have this film. I'd love for you guys. If I'll, I'll give it to you, if you guys want to put it out, you want to show it to anybody. Uh, we've actually had a couple of us, a couple of masks about doing a tour around the UK. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that okay. these people will hopefully get over some of these historical biases, which is really the issue here. And, uh, and that they'll open their eyes. It's like you said, in the, in the first video we did about, you know, hoping that people, uh, uh, come to understand and, and realize that there, there's a whole lot bigger picture out there than maybe what they understand or know of. And, yeah. and that's the case with so many things on our planet. There's just a lot going on when you don't live someplace, <laughs> you know, it, it makes a big difference. The whole thing was, it was eye opening for me. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, there were so many things that I really had no, I had no idea about brew dog and Kinrara. That was, I, I knew brew dog was a kind of, <laughs> It was a kind of dodgy company, but uh, I I didn't know that they they'd bought up this estate. Yeah, yeah, and what, you, what you're, what you're we're, we're not going to give away too much of the plot here, but but what okay. Paul's what Paul's talking about is uh, you know the lands in the Highlands have never been very fertile. Uh, you know, it's a lot of a lot of granite, a lot of rock, a lot of peat bog, and that just doesn't. It doesn't bode well if you're trying to grow crops or trying to even graze animals on it. And really what only seems to have worked really well over the thousands of years of evolution has been deer and, and the other native species that are living there. But because of our carbon uh, schemes that are going on specifically in relationship to uh, human caused global warming, there's a lot of push to come up with solutions. And one of the solutions are carbon markets where if you plant trees, uh, you can get credits and those credits can be used to offset carbon that you truly create, whether you're uh, an airplane manufacturer, uh, a, a train, a boat, a cars, car manufacturers, a manufacturer of anything. If you, if you, if you exude carbon dioxide you know, through the process of whatever your business is, the idea here is that you can uh, basically cancel out that debt you have by planting trees. And in Scotland, in the Highlands, uh, obviously, you're looking for inexpensive land to purchase. Well, farmland down lower is very fertile, much more fertile than the Highlands. Uh, thus, it's much more expensive. So it makes a whole lot of sense that these multinational corporations and BrewDog, a local beer company, uh, have bought up these sporting estates because none of them make any money. Uh, 99% of them, from what I've been able to tell, are completely sub subsidized by the landowners from outside income sources. Uh, so, you know, as far as managing the land for, for the sporting use, you know, whether it be the deer stalking or the grouse driven grouse shooting. And so what you have is a scenario that the scientists tell you that if you plant trees on these lands, even if there's only a few inches of, of peat, uh, which, you know, peat is a huge sequester of carbon that you actually have a negative, uh, a net negative on carbon sequestration over the 40 to 60 year period that you have the trees on the land uh, because the trees become heat sinks. Uh, they absorb heat. They get rainfall that comes through them, which causes acidification of the soil. And then, of course, it kills off all the peat there. But you also, the only way that you can plant these trees, like a place in Kinrara, uh, which the viewers will see there, the, all the aerial shots we did, is you literally have to take heavy equipment out there and break through a natural hard iron pan that was created over thousands of years. So you're destroying thousands of years of soil history on the land, and you're destroying that Heather Moorland, which according to the UN is an ecosystem of concern. 60 to 70 percent of the world's Heather ecosystems exist in the UK, most of it in the Scottish Highlands. And uh, we're mucking it all up. And, you know, it just for me, Paul, I look back at that and, you know, and, and as we were watching this stuff and filming these things, if we had an ecosystem of concern in the United States and you were running heavy equipment on it, destroying, you know, the landscape, 
every environmental organization in the United States would sue you in hours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sue you. Yeah. Yet in Scotland, this is considered to be a good thing. And, and, it, and it relates back to that relationship of what people think of landowners. And, yeah. you know, it's okay. You know, it's landowner has it. We don't care about them. Uh, yet what we're doing is a, is a huge disservice to the ecosystems and to nature. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's not to slut too also, much out of the bag, but yeah. I, I, th- I think it also points to, to the fact that so much of the legislation, whether it's in Scotland, in, in Edinburgh with the Scottish government or in London with the UK government, but so much of the legislation it, it, is, um, is uninformed or, or biased, or but usually it, born of a, a, a great degree of ignorance about yeah. the subject at hand. Yeah, I, I think one of the things I really came to understand, which really came to a head on this project, was none of these organizations, whatever their whatever their cause is. You know, what, you know, we don't need to get into any specifics, but it just seems like they don't have a reason to exist unless there's a crisis with a crisis i can i can go raise money of course without money you don't have an organization i mean yeah it can be made up of volunteers but most of these organizations haul in millions and millions of pounds a year there in 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 the uk and uh and of course once you solve a problem it's like going to the donor and saying hey i need a million pounds to save the earth and the donor gives you a million pounds and then next year you come to him say hey i need another million and he's like, well, you already saved the earth. Why should I give you any money? Goalposts keep. I want to save money. Mars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, so it's been, it's been a, it's been a quite, quite the experience to try to immerse myself in Scottish politics and, and social and cultural issues and land use and conservation issues. And, and so uh, it's well, obviously. We, it's been, we thank you. We yeah. thank you for doing it. Yeah, well, well, thank you. I I have a feeling it may, it may be a little bit thankless with some people if they can't overcome those cultural or, or those historical human biases. But um, mm-hmm. I've got a, already a taste of it on Twitter here. <laughs> and, and on a side note, it's been kind of interesting. You know, you know, of course, you know, I'm an American from the United States, and and uh, my ham my family history goes back to the early 1600s. Here, most of my ancestors are buried all over your island in Ireland, and. Oh, yeah. uh, and so I get into these these discussions where I just ask these very plausible questions about some of the statements that are made on social media, uh, and especially to some of the rewilding people that the specific their handle is rewild Scotland things like that. And they said, "Well, what do you know? You know, you know how how would you know what's going on here?" And even in some of my interviews, uh, you didn't see this, but some of these people said, "Well, you're not from around here. How would you know?" <laughs> and, you know, and Paul, my response is, well, you know, rewilding has been something that's been kind of embraced for maybe the last two decades in Scotland, last 20 years. Uh, yeah. But I come from a country where my ancestors pretty well mucked this place up when it came to our natural resources and our wildlife in the 16, 17 and the 1800s. We decimated yeah. the place. We cut down trees. We cut down, you know, for the, in the name of progress. We killed everything. We thought it was an infinite resource and we found out it wasn't. And wiser heads prevailed in the late 1800s uh, that kind of ushered in this modern conservation ethos that we have here, uh, here in the United States. And, and I suppose uh, I suppose John Muir was part of that. Yeah, he was. So and uh, and so what I've come to realize is, and, I, and a lot of times I have to tell these guys, it's like, you know what, I may not be from Scotland. But where I'm from, we have about 130 years of rewilding experience. And we have these phenomenal national forests and state forests. We have phenomenal populations of wildlife. None of it's perfect, but we've come up with this modern conservation model that as long as people utilize these resources, they take care of them. And it's amazing how what the result of that is that, you know, the creatures have been brought back from the brink of extinction, uh, animals taken off the endangered species list here in the United States. It works. And so that's when I look and have my my, uh, you know, my point of view when I came over to Scotland, you know, was to see, hey, what are you guys doing? Because I hear all these crazy stories. And it really is a lot of craziness going on there. And, and unfortunately, and most of it doesn't, isn't being done in the best interest of wildlife and habitat management. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, Paul, it, you know, 
Is there anything you want to add here about this film that, you know, why people should come and watch it all over the world or anything else, you know, besides listening to your phenomenal music? When this Vikings keep looking for one, the Picts and the Scots keep together to forge what we call Scotland. Not long after that, Normans across the English Channel, more seconds from the seeking states on the David the first. No, uh, quite, quite independently of my music, uh, I, I think it, it's it's um, it's a fascinating look at a very very sticky topic in Scotland. But it's relevant not just to Scotland, but to to anywhere where, where um, land management and land use and land reform are, are questions that. Um, that need to be addressed uh, sooner rather than later. Um, and I would um, urge everyone to try to, to to seek it out. That's great. Well, Paul, it's been great working with you on this project and look forward to many more and want to thank, thank you. you. And if anybody wants to find, I know you have a whole bunch of DVD or music now downloads. Where do people go to find your music online? Well, I am on YouTube. Um, I'm told I'm on Spotify, but I I wouldn't know because I don't use it. Um, yeah, but you, so you have tracks of music people can purchase. So I'll put a few links up on the on the video. I don't. I should have a website, but I don't. Yeah. I I I've been meaning to make a website for over twenty years, and it just hasn't happened. <laughs> you still have business going on, though, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs>